Hola, buenos días. Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to this informat informative session. We organize this every time we have an open call, and in this case, it's the one for literary work circulation. We are lucky to have two representatives of the uh, uh, European institution with us. Uh, I'm glad that they could uh, accept the invitation because, well, we have uh, my colleagues, Carolina and Isabel, they will give you all the details about the budget, the organization. But we thought it was interesting that from the uh, institution managing this uh, uh, grants, uh, they could uh, explain how all this is generated and uh, the, which are the goals, the requirements, so so they can tell us a little bit about, about it all. So thank you really honestly to uh, the two representatives that we have from the Commission. Then we also have uh, my colleagues uh, Isabel and Carolina Fenol. Uh, We've had them in previous sessions as well. And as we did in those cases, we are going to tell you a little bit about their requirements and how all this is organized. And as in prior occasions, we have a case study uh, which uh, uh, illustrates uh, everything we're going to tell you today. We have Susana Ramirez from Galimatazo. Uh, she was fortunate to, to be selected in two different calls. So she has many things I'm sure to share with us. The session uh, is uh, going to be just like in other uh, occasions. Once I finish, I will give the floor to uh, our colleagues in Brussels, uh, Corinne and Laura. And uh, right after that, if there are any questions, uh, you will have the opportunity to to ask your questions. Isabel will be uh, managing that. And then we will have the uh, presentations from Isabel and Carolina. And after that, we will uh, continue with the case study. Uh, as uh, you know, we want this session to be more accessible. So we have interpreting available. For those of you who need it, uh, Maria is also an ally of the office already because she's been working with us in several locations. So if you check on your screens at the bottom, you have a little icon, which is like a uh, world globe, and uh, you have the interpreting service available there. Mostly the session is going to be in Spanish, so you will probably will uh, select Spanish. But those of you who, who need it, uh, you can select the English channel and Maria will be translating for you. The Spanish speakers, uh, the other way around. So basically, uh, this is uh, what I needed to tell you. I think I'm not forgetting anything, right, Isabel? No, yes, that's it. Uh, only, well, the questionnaire. Oh, yes, yes, the survey. Um, I was going to ask you, I wasn't sure if it was going to be like that. Uh, you know that um, after we, we saw the opening video, there's always at the end, there's a little uh, survey, uh, a little questionnaire that we really encourage you to fill in because it helps us a lot to, to improve for future occasions. Um, well, so I give the floor to Corinne and Lara, thanking again from, uh, for being here. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you, Laura. I give you the floor. Thank you, Augusto. Thank you. So, good morning. Good morning, everyone. While Laura is uh, putting in place the, the slides, the presentation PowerPoint, I would like to say a few words to uh, introduce this uh, presentation. So, first of all, uh, I hope that you are well. Um, I don't know how many uh, you are attending this, uh, this information session, but whatever the number, uh, I would like uh, to thank you already for your, for your interest and, uh, and your participation, because we are really happy uh, to, uh, to have this uh, 
really a precious opportunity to uh, present you the 2023 call for proposals um, and its uh, funding uh, opportunities. Uh, let me uh, give you a bit of context. Um, the support for literary translation, and not only uh, translation, but uh, publishing, distribution, uh, has been the only sectoral uh, action of the cultural strand of uh, Creative Europe program so far. That is the only action exclusively dedicated to uh, supporting the book sector and the publishing sector. So it is an, an action that is uh, dear to our hearts um, because experience has uh, shown us that with very little money, we can do a lot. Uh, we can do a lot of things that are useful uh, for the sector, that make sense and that make a difference. And not only for the sector, also for, for the people, I would say, for the readership, actually. So, and um, I don't like to say that, but um, today I would like to say that it's even more important nowadays. So, um, uh, so the program, uh, of course, has already been supporting Spanish publishing houses uh, for a long time, but we hope to support even more in the future and not only uh, publishing houses because with the new program and the new call, um, other uh, cultural operators, other professionals in the book sector are eligible to uh, eligible, sorry, uh, to apply. So this is something um, important uh, to know. Um, so uh, to speak about this call, to uh, speak about the funding opportunities, uh, to speak, to tell you how it is um, uh, useful. Uh, this is one of the reasons we are here today with you. And uh, when I say we, uh, I mean the whole team that works uh, for the book sector uh, for Creative Europe. So today we are not, uh, not all of the team, not all of the people are here with us because they are, uh, some are sick. <laughs> uh, this is something common uh, uh, in this period of time. And some of them, uh, they are uh, lucky enough to be already on holidays. So uh, today we will be only two of us, uh, Laura, uh, we will uh, present the call in a few minutes. Uh, and me, uh, who uh, will help uh, uh, Laura to answer uh, all the questions uh, you might have uh, about, not only about the call, but about the support to the book sector in general. And um, I think that I've been told that uh, there will be also two other members of the team, uh, Marie-Pierre, and uh, Joanna will, uh, will uh, give us a hand if we don't uh, make it. <laughs> so thank you again and uh, have a good uh, session. Thank you for all the Creative Europe uh, Spanish desk for the invitation. And uh, I, I think it's uh, time now to... Uh, to hand the mic over to uh, Laura. So, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. And thank you uh, to the colleagues of the Spanish desk for this kind of invitation and good morning to everybody. Um, I will give now the presentation about the call. Uh, this presentation will be divided in two parts. Uh, the first one more on the call um, teams, priority and objectives, and the second one more on the technical uh, tips and tricks. Um, and I will stop after the first uh, part of the presentation to take question on uh, the first part and then uh, move on. So you can uh, focus on the second part. Concerning the objective of this call, the call on circulation of European literary works 
uh, aim at support the translation, publication, distribution, and promotion of literary works of fiction. And this call has uh, some priorities, uh, among them the strengthening of the transnational circulation of and diversity of European literary works, uh, and this uh, by encouraging the translation and promotion of works of fiction, which are written in lesser used languages, uh, in order to increase the circulation um, of those um, of those um, works in the larger markets in Europe and even beyond, uh, therefore reaching new audiences. Uh, one other um, priority uh, of this call is to strengthen the competitiveness of the book sector by encouraging cooperation within the book value chain, and this including raising the profile of translator and respecting the principle of fair remuneration. And indeed, this last point is one of the uh, specific priorities of 2023 call. Uh, the principle of fair remuneration of writers and translators should therefore be respected in the project that we will finance through this call in line with the translator, translators of, on the cover report. Um, on top of that, we have another priority that is linked to the uh, political situation we are uh, living in the last uh, year, uh, and is to uh, support projects with the objective of providing uh, European or Ukrainian books in Ukrainian language to Ukrainian refugees and displaced people. In this regard, uh, the printing, distribution and promotion of European or Ukrainian works on fiction in Ukrainian language will be eligible. This, even if the book therefore will not be translated, but of course, uh, um, this will come on top of uh, the general LGBT conditions. So anyway, projects that include also uh, not translated Ukrainian books will have to have at least the minimum five books to be translated. We also have some cross-cutting issues that are um, priorities uh, that touch all the uh, projects and all the calls in our programs, uh, in our program, and this is uh, uh, inclusion, diversity, and gender equality, and environment, environment and the fight against climate change. Going to the expected impact of the call, we aim at supporting around 40 projects, um, which can be implemented by a single entity the, for the so-called mono-beneficiary projects, or by a grouping of organization, uh, the multi-beneficiary or consortia. Each project must be based on a sound editorial and promotional strategy, covering, as I said, at least five eligible works of fiction translated from and into the eligible languages. And I will go on this uh, point uh, soon. Uh, the overall budget of the call is 5 million euro. Concerning the eligible languages, the source language and target language must be the officially recognized languages of the eligible countries. At the end of this presentation, we will, you will find a link with the eligible countries uh, for the Creative Europe uh, program. And concerning what we mean by officially recognized languages, those are the languages that are defined by the constitution or any relevant law of the respective country. On top of that, we, <clears throat> we will uh, um, found also translation from Latin and ancient Greek into officially recognized languages. Um, and the translation must have a transla transnational dimension. Therefore, transnational of national literature from one official language into another official language of the same country are in principle not eligible unless there is um, a distribution strategy that goes outside the country in question. And so there's the transnational dimension. If this is the case of the proposal of the project that you are proposing, please make sure that the proposal address the transnational dimension. Uh, which are the eligible literary works that can be covered by uh, the project, our work of fiction, uh, this um, irrespective of their uh, literary genre or format. Um, so you can have digital books, uh, audio books or printed books. And as a, a genre, we can have novels, short stories, theater and radio plays, poetry, comic books and youth literature. Works must already be published. Works must be written by authors that are national of, resident in, 
or recognized as part of the literary, literary heritage of the eligible countries and must not be already translated into the target language unless a new translation corresponds to a clearly assessed need. Also, in this case, as this is an exception, the proposal should really um, justify and explain how uh, and why this new uh, translation is needed. Concerning the size of the project, um, as we have seen, the minimum amount of books uh, per project are five, but we can have uh, three different uh, size of projects. So the small scale projects are project proposing translation of at least five books with a maximum grant of amount of 1,100 euros, 100,000 euros, sorry. Uh, medium scale project proposing translation of at least 11 books with a maximum, ma maximum grant amount of 200,000 euros. And large scale project proposing translation of at least 21 books with a maximum grant amount of 300,000 euros. Uh, the maximum duration for all projects is 36 months, and the co-financing co rate for all projects is 60% of total eligible cost. And going to the payment, uh, the normal uh, schedule of the payment is that we proceed with a, a pre-financing uh, of the 80% of the grant at the beginning of the project. And we don't have an interim payment, but we go directly uh, with a final payment of the rest of the 20% of the grant at the end of the project. As I said, this is the uh, general uh, scheduling of the payment. We can have some exceptional case when the, where the prefinancing is split in two uh, installments. In this case, we will have 40% at the beginning of the project and the rest, the, another 40% uh, toward the mid of the project. Finally, uh, some key features. Um, the call includes also the circulation and promotion, so it's not only about translation and also the other part need to be uh, properly addressed. It's possible to apply as single applicants or as a consortium. Um, we have a corporate tool for the project management uh, that is called eGrants, that is now used by uh, many uh, funded bodies uh, in the uh, European institution. We use lump sum uh, for the reimbursement of the cost. The mother tongue of the translator does not need to be the target language of, uh, uh, for, the, for the translation, as we have seen. Um, and we help the sales of translation rights in Europe and beyond. Uh, we, we hope to support this through this call. So this is the end of the first part of my presentation. Uh, if you have any question, me and Corinne will be happy to uh, reply. Hola, vamos a ver si hay alguna pregunta relacionada con esta parte. Hello, let's see if we have any questions about this first section of the presentation. Elvira asks, what does lump sums mean in the budget? Um, lump sum is, um, is a way to uh, reimburse cost. So instead of having uh, um, applicants, well, funded project to report their real cost, we will fix some, uh, uh, the budget at the beginning of the, of the, I mean, during the grant preparation. Uh, so once the projects are selected, we will fix the base, uh, the, um, the cost based on the uh, real costs that are uh, attached to the application. And then we will have um, a reimbursement based on the work implemented. Uh, specifically, this will be done through the um, deliverables and um, that will be delivered and then the completion of the work packages. I think that uh, it, it will be clearer with the second part of your presentation, Laura. Yes. So that we can see the link between the work packages and the lump sums and the budget. And maybe just to, uh, to add something on this, uh, we used to work with uh, uh, real costs, uh, but um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the 
policymakers and the managers decided to uh, move to a simplification regarding the budget and we moved to lump sum. So once your contract, your grant agreement has been established and the lump sums has been, have been fixed, there is no uh, financial verification. What, you, uh, what we um, check or what we monitor is the good implementation of the project. So that's, that's quite a good news because uh, it's, um, it's difficult to, uh, especially with uh, very small grants, to justify every single uh, euro. And uh, so this is really a simplification. So once this has been fixed, we uh, don't come back uh, to the financial aspect, I would say. So there is no financial audit on the project, only on the implementation of the project. And uh, we just monitor and we check if the project has been implemented as it was planned in the application and if the objectives uh, have been met and um, so this is the reason why we decided they decided not me <laughs> but they decided to to move to uh, to lump sums uh, and uh, and for me it's really really a good thing For both parties, I would say, for both sides, for us who uh, monitor the projects and the, the good implementation of the projects, and for you, beneficiaries uh, or applicants. De todas formas, uh, tanto la parte segunda de Laura como Yes, in any case, uh, uh, in Laura's second part of the presentation and also in our presentations about the technical aspects, we will give you more details about this. We have two other questions. Uh, just remind you to, to post your questions on the Q&A section instead of on the chat. So please, if you can post your questions in the Q&A section, because we use the chat for other things. So it's it's easier for us to, to manage all if you if you post them in the Q&A. So two more questions really quickly for Corinne and Laura. Uh, we are asking whether the project covers uh, uh, the printing of uh, works, uh, which uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, it also covers uh, costs for printing. I don't know if you want to add anything. And they are also asking uh, whether this call is only for lesser spoken languages. Uh, if in Spain, uh, minority languages like uh, Catalan or Euskera, if they could be covered. Are you going to answer or we, or we answer? No, no, we will answer because uh, um, the languages included in the Constitution are eligible languages. So we have projects from Catalan to French, from Euskera to Italian. As, as Sara said, as, uh, sorry, Laura, as Laura said, uh, the translation from uh, between uh, co-official languages are covered by the ministry, but if it's from a co-official language into a language uh, in another state member, yeah, then yes. Uh, I would rather Laura and Corinne to confirm whether if, uh, the gypsies uh, language, is it covered? Yes, what we call the um, the um, uh, the um, the, the nomad languages <coughs> are eligible. And uh, I just want to say, we don't have an exhaustive list of official eligible languages. We don't have this because it's too difficult to have this. Uh, because um, things uh, change. Um, so, and, um, and we, want, uh, we want to be um, flexible as much as possible for the eligibility of their languages, because we have to support diversity with the program. So uh, not only cultural diversity, but linguistic diversity. So it's in the interest of the program to, um, uh, to support as many languages as possible, provided that uh, a language has a link, official or 
recognized a link to um, uh, um, a creative Europe country, it's it's fine. And uh, for uh, for uh, to, just to take the the example of Spain, if you want to uh, to translate from an official language of the country to into another official language. For example, from uh, Castellano into uh, Basque or Catalan, is it absolutely uh, fine, provided that there is a distribution strategy outside the country? So this is, uh, for example, if you want to, um, um, or from Basque or from Catalan into Castellano, if the distribution strategy uh, forces to uh, uh, to have sales in uh, Latin America, it's absolutely fine. So because it must be, this is the basic uh, a basic principle. We must have a transnational dimension or with the distribution or the readership, of course, but we cannot have everything in the, country, in the same country. The translation, the publication, the distribution in the same country, it's not allowed because this is not, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, the national competence to uh, support this kind of project. Creative Europe program must support uh, cooperation and transnational dimension. That's really important. But we are quite flexible for the for the languages, and the the, the best to do is to ask. So please ask the uh, the Creative Europe desk, and um, if uh, our colleagues uh, at the desk uh, have some doubts. They uh, they call us and we decide uh, together if uh, a specific language is eligible or not. So if you have a doubt, please uh, ask. Don't hesitate. And uh, I wanted to add something else about the first question, which was, please recall me, Isabel or Augusto. The answer was uh, yes, clear. Ah, the printing. Yes, of course, the printing is eligible and the distribution as well and the communication and promotion as well because we support literary translation. This is the core activity of uh, the, the projects or the action. But what we want and the, the, the title of the call uh, for proposals, it's very explicit. What we want is uh, to make the books circulate, to uh, increase the readership, to make um, many people to read um, many books. So, of course, if you uh, want a book uh, to be circulated or to be distributed, you have to uh, not only to, to write it, but to uh, translate it and to um, publish it, uh, print it, etc., etc. So this is the reason why um, now with this call, we support all these activities which have the same common objective to make circulate the books as much as possible. Si os parece, vamos con la siguiente pregunta. Yes, eh, let's move on with the following question then from Marta. Hello, how could you define uh, fiction? I understand that self-fiction is included, but what happens with non-fiction, uh, narrative, memoirs, or other uh, genres with where we have uh, literary works, but, but it's a work that is based on reality but um, it, it shares the same uh, goal as fiction. Uh, would poetry and uh, comic books be included as well, whether it's fiction or non-fiction? 
Uh, yes, uh, poetry, uh, comic books, of course, uh, radio plays, uh, theater plays, as um, uh, Laura said earlier. Um, and for this, we are also quite flexible, provided that there is some elements of fiction in the literary work, we accept it. But um, you, I would suggest that in your application and in the five um, uh, books um, which are required as a minimum, I would suggest that there is no doubts uh, for uh, the, the, the main part of the, uh, of the editorial program. I mean that we cannot have doubts for all the books because it's, uh, uh, it could be seen as a, a weakness for your project and your application. So be sure that uh, or at least for most of the books, uh, this is one of the portions sure that it is fiction. But uh, again, uh, I repeat it, we are quite flexible uh, because provided that there are some elements of fiction, we consider this as a literary work and we accept. But again, um, we have to see that we cannot um, for very specific and peculiar um, uh, projects, uh, it's difficult to, uh, you know, to confirm eligibility or not without having documents, um, uh, documentation, etc., to check this uh, eligibility. La siguiente pregunta, y vamos a intentar ir, ir avanzando. The next question, and we'll try to go ahead. Can we have a cultural organization dedicated to promote literature? Excuse me, I, I didn't understand the, the, the question. Maybe Laura La uh, understood, but... Can you repeat it again? I can buscar... repeat, yes. Uh, could uh, be a cultural organization and beneficiary if it's dedicated to promote literature? Yes, these organizations are eligible, yes, of course. Eh, siguiente pregunta de Angel. The next puedo... question from Angel, I can answer. Uh, on the website, I read the, about the projects that are going to be financed. I don't know if it's uh, in Spain or in all in Europe, the 40 projects. No, that's in, in Europe as a whole, all the projects participating in, uh, in Creative Europe. And then we will continue, if you don't mind, two more questions and then we move ahead. Uh, I hear that the grant is for publishing houses uh, who are going to publish lesser spoken publishing houses. So uh, publishing house uh, translating books from English into Spanish cannot be a beneficiary of the of the grant. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I want to I would like to remove a misunderstanding. So all organizations working in the book sector are eligible, not only the publishing houses, but all the professionals and all the organization working in the book and publishing sector. Um, and, uh, and of course, a publishing house that um, uh, uh, translate into Spanish, provided that it is, uh, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's absolutely uh, fine. Uh, uh, to be honest, I don't understand the question <laughs> because um, yes, you you are you are not obliged to translate it into um, another language uh, other than your uh, country language. So, uh, publishing houses uh, from Spain. Uh, translating from uh, French into Spanish is absolutely uh, admissible and eligible. Uh, from um, from German to Spanish into Spanish, um, all the Creative Europe uh, languages. 
and even as I said before, even from uh, Basque or Catalan into uh, Castellan. Siguiente pregunta: las cinco obras. Next question: the five works need to be unpublished for before you receive the the grant. Uh, no, this is uh, absolutely the contrary. The work, all the five uh, uh, works must be uh, published before they are uh, translated. So you have in the um, eligible works, in the call for proposals, you have um, um, a complete exhaustive list of uh, eligibility uh, criteria for the uh, for the works so you will see that the the works uh, the literary works uh, must have been translated uh, must have been published before they are proposed uh, for translation this is a, a requirement if not the the the, um, uh, the, the work is not uh, accepted is not eligible is the translation in the target language that shouldn't be uh, already be there unless for very specific uh, needs. Yeah, yeah. So. Of course, we support, the program supports uh, new translations, of course, to, uh, yeah, uh, to um, make the people discover uh, other works in other languages. This is the objective, the main objective of this uh, of this action. Si os parece, vamos a continuar con la presentación. Uh, now, if you don't mind, we will continue with the presentation. I just want to insist in two aspects because we are receiving many questions about these again and again. Eligible languages are all the languages of the participating countries in uh, Creative Europe. It's not only dedicated to lesser spoken languages, minority languages. It's true that we have that into account mm, uh, and also the translation in two languages or uh, books by authors in lesser spoken languages. Those are considered uh, in the call, but are not. they are not the only ones. But only uh, fiction uh, works. They are asking whether books about psychology, for example, no, those wouldn't be considered for this call. Those are not eligible. And now, if you don't mind, we continue with Laura's uh, second part of the presentation. Okay. So let me continue with the second part. It is a bit more technical and is really about how the um, application, uh, the submission service and the application forms uh, work. So the submission <clears throat> has to be done in the funding and through the funding and um, portal. Um, once you um, have introduced the information about your own entity, in case of project with more than one beneficiary, there's a, a functionality to add a new partner. Uh, as you can see, you can choose a partner or associated partner. Um, in case you have a project with more than one participant, please pay attention to the coherence uh, between the different parts of the application and the budget so that all the uh, partners are listed in all the different parts. There are different roles in a project depending on the level of participation uh, in the project itself. Uh, so we have applicants, uh, which are the beneficiaries uh, and the coordinator and affiliated entities. Affiliated entities are entities that are linked to beneficiary with similar rights and obligation, but do not sign the grant agreement and therefore do not become beneficiary themselves. And then you can also have some associated partners that are organ organization would participate to the action, but without the right to get the grant um, and basically to be paid through the grant. Uh, and this can also be, for example, from non-eligible country organization. So going to the proposal form, the proposal itself is made by three parts and a series of annexes. Part A is the administrative information about the participants. 
Part B is the technical uh, description of the project. Part C gives us the overview of the books. Um, and as you can see, part A and part B are done directly, are completed directly online, uh, while part B is a template that is provided and, uh, and need to be um, filled in and uploaded um, in the system. And then we have uh, uh, five annexes, uh, the detailed budget table, uh, list of previous project, CV of the translator, list of publication, declaration on publication. I will explain uh, more in detail all of them. Just one major point, please use the correct templates and do not change them. The templates are inside the portal. They have to be downloaded through the portal, fill in and then uploaded. Here you see how it looks like uh, the system. So um, well, the first button added form is to add it to the part A. Uh, and uh, the second is for the part C. And then below, you have all the different compulsory annexes and the part B, and there's the possibility to upload. The system will block, if not all the, um, the uh, compulsory element are uh, uploaded. Now, going to the um, uh, different parts, um, concerning part A, the first part is the general information on the project. So as you can see on the right, you will have to fill in information about the language, uh, the title of the project, the duration. As we have seen, maximum duration is 36 months. So the, pro the, the system will not allow you to put any, um, any other figures that are more than 36. Then you have a first part that is called fixed keywords. Um, you have to choose a keyword that uh, define your project for a list uh, and uh, prioritize them in order of importance with the matching with the content of the project. And those are very important because it's what we use to uh, allocate proposal to the different um, experts during the evaluation. So it's really used for the evaluation of the project. Uh, then there's a second part that are the free keywords. There you can write up to 200 characters and uh, it's uh, the space that you can use if you cannot find um, proper keywords to define uh, in detail your project. Um, so uh, there you can uh, really like try to go to the specific uh, content of the project. And then there's a part that is uh, called EC priorities, uh, which is used for statistical purposes of the different application. And it's basically to match the priorities, uh, the project, the proposals against the priorities of the call. In the part A, you also have a sec section dedicated to the budget. So here you have to uh, indicate the EU, um, the requested EU grant per beneficiary, not the total cost. As we have seen, the project funds 60% of the total cost. Uh, to help you find the correct amount, we um, have a budget table, so an Excel sheet that you will fill with more and uh, details. And uh, the last column of this budget table, that is column AP, uh, will show you the max total EU contribution. This is the amount that you have to put here per beneficiary in case of multi-beneficiary. Concerning the part B, this is the technical description. So it's the narrative part where you describe the project. There is a limit of 70 uh, pages. That means that uh, the system will uh, warn you if you upload uh, a document that is longer, but will not prevent you to upload it. But uh, the pages after the limit of 70 pages will not be visible uh, neither to the evaluators nor to, to us. So it's like if that part doesn't exist and the project will be assessed as it is up to page seven. Uh, then there's a part uh, consisting on the list of previous project. This is the last page of the template and it has to be separated from the rest of part B, fill in independently and upload it separately as we have seen as one of the annexes of the compulsory annexes. Here we have, you have to list the project that um, have been implemented by the participants in the last four years, including, of course, the most relevant project related to the nature of the proposal. And previous project can be funded by the EU or not. So also national uh, or local entities. Um, in part B, uh, you will also um, put the 
major uh, subdivision of the project, so uh, the different work packages. And for each work package, um, you will have to list the objectives, the list of activities, uh, milestone you can put, this is not compulsory, and the deliverable that are the concrete outputs to prove uh, the implementation and the, and the activities. Uh, in the section 10 of uh, the call documents, you find um, um, a description of all the, the, the work packages and the compulsory deliverables. We have four mandatory work packages for all projects, uh, which are project management, translation, publication and distribution, promotion and communication. And as said, you will find a, a deep description um, in, the, in the call document. Also, we have an, uh, a fifth work package for uh, projects proposal that support the Ukrainian works of fiction. So if this is the case, the fifth project, the fifth work package should be added, and this should group all the activities of printing, promotion, and distribution of work of fiction in Ukrainian language. So in order to um, have them visible, um, as well as the visibility of the author. Percy uh, is uh, the another part that you fill in directly online and gives us additional project data. All fields are mandatory uh, and you will have a warning if the, those fields are not filled in. Um, you will have to put additional information on the applicants and overview, overview of books and one entry per book um, covered by the proposal is needed. And here you can see basically are all the information about the book's title, uh, the year of publication, the format, um, the genre, the language, the regional language, the target language, and then we also ask you uh, information about uh, the author and the translator. Um, going to the budget table, um, so this is an Excel uh, document that where you will fill in all the information about the, the budget. As said, the projects are based on lump sum, but those lump sum are calculated starting from um, actual cost. So the aim of this table is to allow you to um, insert all the actual costs that you envisage for the project, and then the table will um, produce the overall lump sum per work package. And this is the information that then you will find in the grant if the project will be uh, selected. Um, costs are per unit and number of units per each category. Uh, and here you see all the different cost categories. So you have direct personal cost, where one unit is one person mouth. So uh, subcontracting cost, purchase cost, uh, other cost category, and the indirect cost. Going a bit, a bit uh, uh, on the specific uh, of some tips of this budget table, uh, as said, the template is uh, available among all the templates in the, in the submission uh, system. Uh, it must be downloaded as it is, so in XLSM, but then when you re-upload, it has to be in XLSX. There are macros and formulas in the table that should not be modified or erased, and you should pay attention that no error message is shown up Every, anywhere in the table. This is important because otherwise we will not be able to, um, to read the document and therefore the expert will have uh, issue in assessing the feasibility uh, of the project itself. Um, once more, please ensure consistency uh, with work packages and with the budget that will be inserted in the uh, part A. So as said before, uh, please um, Pay attention to pick up the uh, correct amount in the column AP uh, and put it in the section three of part A. Then some additional information. Um, at the end of the, this table, you will also have uh, uh, two tabs that are for the depreciation cost and for uh, any other comments. Uh, those parts have to be filled in. Uh, the first part, in case you have uh, equipment cost declared, and this tool will help you 
to uh, calculate the depreciation cost. And uh, the second part, if you indicate other in uh, A1 staff cost or C3 other goods and services. And there you will be requested to provide additional uh, information on uh, what those other costs will cover. And then just a warning, the different tabs are not communicated automatically, so you will really have to fill in manually whenever you insert uh, some information in uh, one of those specific uh, uh, cost categories. Finally, the timeline uh, and deadlines. Um, so the call opened on the 15th of November. Uh, the deadline for submission is the 21st February 2023 at 5 in, in the afternoon. Uh, we aim of having uh, the evaluation uh, between March and May and to inform uh, on uh, evaluation result between June and July. And this will lead to the signature of the grant agreement and so the starting of the project uh, between August and October. Of course, this timeline and deadlines are indicative because uh, it will also depend on how many proposals uh, we will receive. Uh, before taking a, a question, I will also uh, give you just some uh, short information about uh, the result of the last two uh, calls. So in 2021, uh, we founded 40 projects uh, from 17 countries out of the 95 proposal received and this equal to 365 uh, translators 519 translated books and 40, 450 authors and you can see the repartition uh, so small scale projects were the biggest one um, followed by the medium scale and uh, a minor part of the uh, large scale. Um, actually, uh, those are the results based on main list uh, um, project funded. Um, in 2021, we were able actually to fund more projects. So all the projects from the reserve list as well uh, have been funded. And so in total, we actually funded 45 projects. Similar results. Um, were last year, uh, but we had an increase of 18% uh, of applications. So we received 113 uh, proposals and we were able to found uh, 41 projects from the main list. Also in this case, we were soon uh, um, moving to fund also projects from the reserve list. So in principle, we, we should be able uh, to found uh, 45 projects. Um, and you can see the number of uh, translated books um, are more or less the same as in the previous year. Um, 285 translators, 380 authors, 34 original languages and 18 target languages. And then um, an additional word on uh, some publications that we um, made on the um, Creative Europe support book sector uh, during the previous uh, um, financial framework, so the year between 2014 and 2020. We published two brochures. The first one um, is a summary of the program impact on the European book value chain uh, and basically uh, cover all the projects that are supported in the, in the, through the program, uh, apart from the literary translation funding scheme, so for the other actions, and actually it covers 84 uh, projects. And this includes some information on each supported project, uh, including the description, quotes uh, from beneficiary, and link to online project resources and uh, the uh, online uh, Creative Europe platform. And then we have a second brochure that is uh, um, targeting the uh, 400 projects uh, that were funded uh, through the literary translation funding scheme uh, of Creative Europe 2014-2020. Um, and here you have, as I said, 400 projects from over 40 different countries and more than 3,000 translations that were covered uh, through uh, the, the previous um, program call. Uh, Toward the end of the brochure, there is also an exclusive list of all projects and books selected for funding under the Creative Europe. 
and here you can see a nice quotation from Italo Calvini, without translation, I would be limited to the border of my own country. The translator is my most important ally, he introduced me to the world, and this is what we hope that uh, our, uh, our program, our scheme uh, could do uh, to many authors. Last word. Um, if you are interested in working with us as an expert, uh, please contact us through the, uh, our functional mailbox. Yeah, Creative Europe translation at ec.europa.eu. Uh, .eu. And uh, you can also uh, directly create an account, an expert account on the funding and tender portals. Here is the link, but I will just quickly show you how it looks like. So there's really a section on work as an, an expert, and you can start your registration. And uh, actually, it's from this database that we selected uh, the expert that helps us uh, in the evaluation of the project for our calls. Here, there's all the useful link, uh, the call document, the um, funding guide, and uh, uh, all other important uh, documents for this call and in general for Creative Europe, and our contacts. And with this, you, I thank you. Muchas gracias. And we take Muchas gracias. Sí, Laura. Eh, bueno, Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, Laura. You know that we have limited time for these webinars. Uh, I wanted to clarify, obviously, yes, what I said before about the co-official languages. They, uh, you clarified. So, so yes, those uh, co-official languages are eligible uh, as long as we have that transnational dimension. So I just wanted to be clear uh, as uh, Corinne clarified. Thank you. Now we will uh, try to move uh, fast because we are a little bit uh, behind. Mm -hmm. Isabel, I give you the floor and uh, we will start with your presentations or we, I don't know, we also answer some questions, whatever you prefer. Yes, we will continue with the presentations and we will leave all the questions for the uh, for the for the end, because many of them probably are going to be answered with our presentations. So if it's okay okay with Laura and Corinne, we will uh, continue now. Uh, I'll start. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Hold on a second. Oh, I don't know if you can see my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes. There you go. Okay, so Carolina and I, we are going to focus on the template uh, aspect that Laura mentioned, and also in the budget, the Excel uh, sheet that you will have to fill in. In that part B, the technical description of the project includes uh, a template that you can fill in using any of the official languages in the European Union, but we recommend that you use English. Um, it can be up to 70 pages. This is very important because if you go over that 70 page limitation, the uh, pages after page 70 won't be visible for the experts to assess the project. So bear that in mind. Remember, 70 pages maximum. Also, you need to respect uh, the minimum uh, 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 source that is, uh, when typing, you need to use Arial size 9. Don't change anything in the template. Don't erase anything because you will um, get more space uh, and all the participants maybe won't do that because uh, so so it's a uh, something it's a requirement that we include you cannot change anything in the template you need to use very concise explanations you will see why because we're going to go section by section the different sections uh, need to be consistent Mm, with each other, you'll see that you will mention the budget or some aspects in different sections, so it need to be consistent. 
throughout the whole proposal. Uh, you cannot use uh, links, external links. And this uh, document that you will download as a Word document, you will need to upload it as a PDF document. All these things that I'm mentioning, you will have them explained at the beginning of the template of the, of the form. You can erase that page with the explanation. So that, that's a page you can gain. So you can gain that one page with the instructions. You can erase that before you upload the document. And also the last page in the form, in the template, which refers to the annex with a list of projects that you you have to take it out of the document that's a, an independent annex okay so those are two more pages that you have available for your proposal as you can see here uh, this is a, a summary of all the different sections uh, all the different uh, uh, parts of the of the description we are going to focus on all these uh, different sections first we have the assessment requirements it's very important for you to bear all this in mind. Then we have the work packages and, and, and all the sections. So we start with this brief reminder. It sounds uh, quite evident, but we always insist on this. It's very important that you answer to everything you're being asked in each different section. What is it that we're asking you? If you, if you pay attention here, you have this little uh, box, this, this uh, text box with uh, this one uh, with gray background. This is where we are explaining what you need to uh, to say, to mention in the section. Okay, so it's, you have to try and see if you are answering to everything that we are asking you in all the different sections. And we suggest that you, you answer in all these different sections, having the call document next to you as you can see on pages 17 and 18 you have an explanation of how everything is going to be assessed the criteria the evaluation criteria that we're going to use impact uh, distribution uh, the, so at the same time as you are filling in the form please have those requirements in the call document next to you so you can check whether you are answering and you're complying with all those uh, requirements and also we want to remind you that throughout the form, you're going to see some comments. Uh, for example, here, staff effort, staff effort. These are sections that you don't have to fill in. You have this uh, clarification in green. Okay, so you have for lamps and grants. These you don't need to fill in. So you're going to see um, which ones are required, which ones are compulsory and which ones are optional because this one for example is for uh, the, the form is used also for other calls so first page you need to fill in uh, the table with the project name the project acronym and the coordinator contact and you also have the project summary in this uh, part a you have to include these online so you are going to include that description in english of the project so the expert can have an idea of uh, about the project very concise very brief and then they will check uh, the project and then we uh, let's move to the different sections first the uh, uh, relevance uh, criteria we have the four different aspects included in this uh, section what do you need to answer in this section it's very important that you describe the context of the project so you've chosen five books as a minimum for their translation and that a uh, minimum of five uh, works so depending on the categories it can be more or less they need to have uh, a topic that they are covering and why why did you choose that topic that uh, that area in that section, you will need to answer why is your project relevant and how it complies with the priorities of the call. What Laura mentioned at the beginning, how that work selection is going to contribute to increase uh, the diversity of uh, uh, 
works in Europe or uh, how is it going to promote lesser spoken languages in Europe? How is it going to reach a new uh, audiences? So what you need to do here is you need to explain um, the logic that the context of those uh, works that you have selected. Then after that, uh, the needs analysis. If you've decided to select those uh, works, those books, uh, you did it because you identified um, a topic that hasn't been covered in literature or in translated works in Europe or any other reasons. So you need to explain, to really explain very well uh, what need is being addressed with your project. And you can provide data why you identi identify that need, okay? Here you should also include uh, clear, measurable and realistic objectives uh, for the project. So uh, for each objective that you are identifying in your project, you should include some indicators that are uh, adequate uh, to assess uh, the fulfillment of those goals. You need to establish how you're going to measure each action, what is the starting point, uh, where you begin as a publishing house, as a project, and what is the objective? Where do you want to get with the project? And about the third uh, aspect uh, in this relevance section, it's very important that you tell again what's the contribution of the project, bearing in mind the results that you achieved with prior projects. Uh, as Lauda said, you can check uh, the platform of uh, Creative Europe so you can have an idea of all the projects that have been uh, funded uh, before, so you can get to know what are the topics that have been covered, which authors have been selected, so you that way you will be able to see whether you are actually offering something new so your project can uh, complement, can really add, contribute with something. You could explain how your project uh, complements other actions that have been carried out by older organizations in the past. And finally, the European dimension, which Laura also mentioned, uh, projects need to have that transnational dimension. It needs to have an impact in other countries in the European Union the possibility to apply the results in other countries, etc. And you can also mention what countries are going to benefit from the project or from the actions that you're going to carry out. And the last part of this uh, relevance section is those uh, cross-cutting priorities that um, Laura mentioned. Here it's important that you um, explain how your project is going to contribute to uh, environmental challenges, how it's going to be sustainable, as sustainable as possible, and how it's also going to promote diversity, gender equality. You have a specific section here uh, in, in uh, section four within relevance, where you can explain or detail the different actions that, are, that you're going to have throughout the whole project. Then we have the second evaluation criteria, the quality of the content and activities. In the first section, concept and methodology, as you can uh, imagine, you have to explain what is the methodology you're going to use in your project to uh, fulfill those objectives. It's very important that you uh, specify the uh, editorial uh, strategy that you're going to use and it has to uh, be consistent with the selection of works and authors that you've selected for the project. If your um, application is uh, uh, presented as a partnership or consortium, uh, if, you, if you do it together with other organizations, here in 2.2 two, two, you have to uh, detail the different members of the consortium, why those are the parties, how is every each member going to contribute, how the different members contribute, uh, complement each other, etc. 
So you have to explain why those members of the consortium are, are there, right? What, what is their role? What are the resources they're going to use? It's important that when you create a consortium, you need to think of organizations that can help you in fulfill the project's objectives or maybe tackle the different challenges that you're going to come across. The third section, uh, here you need to define very well, it's very important, you need to define the different uh, targeted audiences. You need to specify how you're going to reach those target audiences. Uh, you know that each of them may have different channels, different tools, and you need to explain to detail of all these how it, the project is going to change everything for them. And the fourth section, project design, you're asked for a description of the project and the, its main activities. Here, you need to describe the main activities uh, to be undertaken, uh, whether it's uh, uh, distribution, communication, publication. I'll, you will have, you can provide more details uh, for, uh, later on, but here you give us a first description of all these activities so we can identify uh, the reason and the results that you expect to obtain. For example, uh, the distribution strategy, which will uh, guarantee that you will have access to those works that you're going to translate that are part of your package. Also, if it's a, a, a multi-beneficiary application, you will need to explain the role of each organization. And it's also important in this section, you don't need to repeat the information that you will include in section five. Carolina will tell you now about it, but here you need to provide details for the expert to understand all the logic or all, all the um, mission in the project. If you want to uh, obtain funding for third parties, but I don't know whether you are going to organize some kind of award or some uh, grant. It's not usually the case, okay? But if it's something you're considering in this section, um, if it's applicable, if it's eligible, we'll need to explain very well what that action is going to be, what the funding for third parties is going to be, what are the characteristics, the uh, selection criteria, etc. Third section, project management. This is the third evaluation criteria. In this uh, 3.1 section, you have to explain whether uh, if you have different organizations uh, participating, you need the uh, mechanisms for decision making in the project, how you're going to manage the relationships between the different uh, partners, how decisions are going to be made, how you're going to guarantee uh, effective communication, and also you need to explain um, planning and control methods during the execution of the project, or during the impl implementation of the project. In the second section, in this uh, third criterion, you need to define the team of the project, how it's going to work. You need to include the, the list of, uh, of the staff uh, that you mentioned in section A, and depending on the different functions or, or profiles, the roles, the different roles, you will have to include all these people with that same uh, categories that you included. You need, it needs to be consistent with the information you provided in uh, section A, okay? You have to just copy and paste. Uh, you need to include the name, the organization, and uh, that person's roles or tasks. If the project is going to need external uh, elements or resources, so whether you are going to outsource uh, some parts of the project or uh, we're going to cooperate with other organizations, here is where you need to mention all that. 
we will have the different organizations, the different uh, people. This is like a summary. It's like a general summary where you explain why you are going to outsource uh, some aspects, why you are going to use external resources. And then uh, you provide all the details in section five, which is what Carolina will explain. Then we have all the information about the budget. You will need to detail the different measures that you're going to use to achieve the goals in the project, how you're going to use those resources uh, and uh, maximize the, uh, their effectiveness. And in the case where you are different partners, you need to also explain how each of them is going to do this. And also you need to explain how you're going to distribute the different uh, financial resources and how they are going to be managed by the consortium. You don't need to compare and justify the costs of each uh, work package. You just need to explain why your project is uh, profitable. Then you have the last section related to the project management which is well the measures that you are going to provide to, to for quality assurance also the methods that you will uh, implement for monitoring and controlling the, the project and you also here you have to describe your evaluation strategy this is very important because it's one of the key aspects uh, that we assess in the proposals uh, the, the quantitative and qualitative indicators that you're going to use for monitoring and controlling the project all the time. As I was saying before, these indicators need to be realistic and measurable, and they need to include those th three stages, right? Uh, the, 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 the measurement unit, the starting point, and the objective uh, expected. Uh, then in this last section, you also have this table where you need to identify the risks that you may find throughout the project. Imagine, for example, in the years uh, that were submitted uh, before the pandemic, we had the risk of some activities that were going to be presential and then they ended up being online. That may be a risk for the project. Uh, well, in this part of the budget, you have to um, uh, consider all those risks that you think that you, you may uh, find throughout the project whether how likely it's going to, to to be to take place and the measures that you would uh, the actions that you uh, could take if that happened then in this last evaluation criteria uh, uh, we're going to assess the impact and ambition of the project you will need to describe the uh, impact in a short medium and long term and when we tell you that you need to answer everything they are asking uh, well, if we are asking for impact in the short, medium and long term, you cannot forget. You need the three of them, okay? You have to describe the, the objectives uh, with all these three aspects. Maybe sometimes you are answering about all their needs. Maybe the project is not uh, highly innovative, but you need to explain the changes that you expect to, to, to achieve. When applicable, you need to specify what are the uh, non-European countries that are going to benefit from these actions and why the project is important for them. If many of you are Spanish publishing houses, for example, you're going to maybe include a distribution, distribution strategy for Latin America, for example, right? If there are countries, non-European countries that are going to benefit from these actions, you need to specify this, right? And why they are going to benefit from it. And you also have to explain why the project is trying to improve the situation in the uh, target countries. And about the communication and visibility. You are familiar with this. You will have to explain the communication and, uh, and dissemination strategy, the different actions that you will have included in the project to maximize its impact. You also need to explain how you're going to address the uh, target audiences, uh, the, the information you mentioned in target groups before. Mm. 
how you're going to to give visibility uh, for of your works to the policymakers and to the general audience as well. Uh, what are the channels you're going to use to to, to reach uh, all those uh, audiences, all these groups? And then you need to describe how you're going to give visibility to European funding. The last uh, criteria, evaluation criterion, the experts will uh, have this, uh, bear this in mind when they are assessing your project. You need to describe how the project is going to continue once the uh, uh, funding uh, stops. Then the impact of the project, what you need, uh, what are the parts of the project, how could it continue, what are the resources that are needed to continue with the project, uh, how are you going to use the results, and whether they are uh, possible synergies with all the European uh, programs to be able to continue with the project. And finally, I give the floor to Carolina, who will continue with the explanation of the form. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to try and be brief because we are a little bit behind, but I'll just uh, complement the, the things that were already mentioned by our colleagues. You can see it all right, right? You can hear me okay? Very good. Well, we have section five about the uh, distribution of the work packages. As we said before, it's a way to structure all the activities uh, in the project. We have these different work packages and, well, we have to uh, describe, to submit detailed descriptions with all the data that I will mention. In the first section, we have the work plan. It's just a, a summarized idea of the general concept of these five work packages. Maximum one line, I would say, or even you can have like, like a chart to, to, for it to be uh, more easy to under, easier to understand. Um, you have some explanations here because terminology is very important. You need to know what we are talking about when we say uh, work package, deliverable, etc. We will see all that. First, we have the structure of the contents that we have to include for each work package. You have to copy and paste that for each of the different work packages that you have. So, as you can see, First, you have to specify the duration of the work package, who's leading that section. Obviously, we need to have the same uh, project manager that we mentioned. We need to include some specific objectives related to the work package, the different tasks or activities with a brief description. Here, we need to include, when, when it says participants, be careful because it's very common this mistake we are not referring to a single person with a name and surname no we're talking about an organization usually many of you are applying as uh, single beneficiaries but if it's a consortium you need to specify the organization here on this uh, column you need to specify uh, whether the activity implies any specific contribution. Uh, for example, if you're going to have a presentation in the in Instituto Cervantes and they're going to, uh, you're going to use a specific venue or some services that an organization is going to provide, or if you're outsourcing, um, for example, sometimes in some projects, uh, um, uh, financial um, management is outsourced, for example. That, that, that could be an example. Then we have the minimum uh, structure with these four work packages. Uh, then we have the additional fifth one for uh, Ukrainian uh, fiction works. Or we can add some others, for example, one for 
financial support uh, if you have uh, i don't know imagine a contest for young writers or for, for young illustrators right that wouldn't be one of the main work packages three key concepts that are going to be covered in the grand agreement uh, the agreement that you're going to sign with uh, the office when you are granted the the, the grant then we have the milestones with different uh, moments controlling uh, indicators that are going to to measure the success of the projects this is not compulsory i insist but it could be well i don't know the kickoff meeting you have with brussels or the the submission of the first draft of a translation for example and we continue about the deliverables it's very important that you specify the different activities because uh, linked with that we will have the specific deliverables the material deliverables that justify each action so we need to say here which action they correspond to for example you see different categories here are if it's a document for example the report about the quality control in the project uh, we have uh, different acronyms for example DEC if it's a website now you're going to create a website the dissemination level mm. this is also important because this is all covered then by the agreement by the grant agreement contract that you sign here you can specify whether the uh, if you consider that the, the, the commission is going to publish these you need to see whether this is going to be published or if it's a uh, confidential information um, then we have a due date approximate due date and then we have another column where we have the description where you can add the format that you're going to use and the language okay don't forget some examples of deliverables for example where uh, publications a brochure uh, a flyer or for example if you organize uh, events for example the book presentation with the author and the translator that could be you the deliver could be the, the the program of the event with the the list of attendees or or a video uh, of the event or uh, or a, a survey that you um uh, carry out after the event to, to see the impression of the attendees, all those things. Then we have uh, the different tasks here. It's important to, to, to respect the terminology so we know the kind of beneficiaries that we are talking about. We would have the beneficiaries, the, the partners, the official partners in the consortium, but then we can have associated partners or affiliated entities for example the associated partners can be or, or the affiliate affiliated entities can be from other countries countries uh, non-member countries mm. for example cooperators in the uk who are going to collaborate with us or any other cultural centers well they are not from member countries but they are going to participate with specific contributions and also here it's very important for each package we have mandatory compulsory deliverables and that is very important it, you can read it there in red so you don't forget it's very important in section one uh, we don't have uh, compulsory deliverables uh, it's true that it's good not to have too many deliverables but in section one for example we could have uh, the calendar with a different with a, the timeline right we can have uh, a group uh, calendar for all the books for example or the quality assessment report then for work package two uh, the mandatory deliverables are the agreements the payment declarations and the signed declarations by the translators those are the compulsory ones uh, you can get the form from uh, brussels well, and with these documents you can confirm that the payments uh, 
have been performed and uh, that they respect the fair uh, remuneration principle. Then in uh, World Package 3, the uh, compulsory deliverables are, well, the publication of the translator's uh, biography in the book and the digital copy of each book. Then in uh, World Package 4, we have all the non-compulsory deliverables, uh, well, maybe drafts or different events. And it's important to have all this per book. And I mean, sorry, uh, the work package two and three, uh, you need one per book. And work package four is for the general vision. And then we have some specific aspects for each book because obviously, well, the dissemination and publication, for example, are going to be different for, for each different book, depending on the language or the topic. Okay, so we may need specific actions depending on uh, for each book. We have uh, optional deliverables, uh, depending on the dissemination and communication strategy. So you can do this uh, on site or online. You may have different dissemination campaigns, newsletters, I don't know, all kinds of uh, publications for promoting uh, these books, digital resources, uh, like press releases, uh, banners, online banners, uh, book trailers. Sorry, I'm going to charge my battery. OK, we can continue. And then once you've explained all those deliverables, we can sum up here to have a global vision and we indicate all the different events we can have training sessions if, 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 if uh, applicable for example you can include participation in book fairs um, any events that you organize with the authors with the translators digital events all that should be specified and detailed uh, in this section you specify the type of event, which, well, it could be hybrid events in some cases. What's the location, the area, the duration, the number of participants, uh, estimated number of participants that, that you consider. And then we have the timetable. You have two different timetables. One is for two year long projects and another one for longer projects. And here you need to specify uh, per different work package and per action within those work packages. You set the date on the timetable. And finally, you have sections six and seven. Those are brief. Uh, you have the eligibility factors. You need to uh, guarantee that you're not going to receive European funding for the same project, for the same activities or actions. And then the uh, annex documents. Well, Laura already mentioned it, but you have all the list of uh, the different annexes. Uh, just one reminder, in the translator's curricula, they need to be unified with the rest of the team assigned to the project. Okay, and then the last one, the declaration about the publications, we need to bear in mind that this is a template, it's a, a, a form, and you need to uh, uh, respect all the different uh, criteria, all the requirements that uh, the work has been published, that you are already in touch with the translators that you're going to propose. Uh, so, so we are. Uh, we can know that the project is uh, feasible. Okay, that you have started negotiations for the um, copyright. And now I cannot. I don't have a lot of time for these. But common mistakes. Uh, Isabel already mentioned a few, but I want to insist on some of them because we also the, our technical team. We are not the evaluators of the proposal, but we also check the proposals sometimes if we have the the, the time so we, we also give our advice we 
And something that we often see is that sometimes the proposal is not mm, well, detailed enough. It's true that there may be some changes in, in the budget, um, but we sometimes see that some aspects are not explained in enough detail. Then we'll see how we do these ones. We have the project. We'll, we'll see if we have three or four uh, dissemination events. No, it's uh, more convenient is if you already have uh, thought all that, if you have your internal methodology, you include the, the tools, the different things you're going to use for the, for the management of the project. Or sometimes we also see uh, that we don't have uh, seg segmented target audiences, right? Uh, for example, if we're going to uh, cover some gender issues, or so, so we need to plan all that ahead, okay? Uh, because we need to have a communication plan adapted to each of those different segments. We are not going to have the same uh, message or the same channel depending on the target uh, target audience. And then the deliverables are part of the agreement, okay? Uh, as we said before, so now we don't need to justify each independent cost with the bills or the invoices after the project. We only justify actually the deliverables because that's what tells us whether the project has been uh, accomplished and delivered in the time and form uh, agreed, okay? So we need to have that adequate strategy. We need to justify the innovation that we are contributing with uh, in each project. Because well, well, we, with these projects, we want to, uh, to, to, to react to an opportunity for, for innovation. So, well, about the management of the projects, you have different guides online. You can check uh, all the projects that can be a reference for you. Uh, for example, the level of uh, how satisfactory were other projects with the translations, with the uh, authors, if uh, the deadlines have been uh, respected, all that. And then about the budget, we need to include some aspects of the budget in uh, section A, then also a detailed description in section B, and then it needs to be consistent with all the information covered also in the annex. Mm -hmm. Then we have the call for proposals, uh, and in that document, we have the form of the grant agreement. Um, you can see the, the, the form, the template, so so you can check the different elements that are included in the agreement. And um, the, the annotated grant agreement is a longer document, it's a, it's a, a guide for the participant, uh, for the beneficiary. And it includes all the different possibilities and all the different programs for funding in the European Union, all the different calls. It includes all the uh, eligible costs uh, and non-eligible costs, depending on the call that you want to check. And well, with, with these, uh, you can, well, uh, better have a better understanding of all the terminology used in, in these processes and then about the lump sum system uh, i want to add something that i think it could be useful for understanding this we have two different lump sums and in the in section b we refer to these both systems we need to to know which one we are apply we are using we have the prefixed lump sums, and these are not the ones included in this call, because these are already used in the proposal uh, stage. Ours are the second type. They 
refer to an estimation of real costs, a real estimation of the costs. So you need to justify all those real costs, different groups of costs. And if you are finally a beneficiary, those lump sums will, th th those quantities, those amounts, will become the lump sums. In any case, you need to have some financial control. Obviously, internally, you need to have a detailed budget because then we will see it, but in the budget, you will need uh, grouped costs. And in the end, the payments will be uh, performed at the end of the implementation stage and when the deliverables are uh, delivered for each uh, work package. Eligible uh, costs need to be justified, uh, reasonable, and they need to correspond to some of the actions uh, in the project. We need to comply with uh, VAT uh, uh, regulations uh, according to all the uh, applicable taxes. Um, it, it's okay we start at the beginning of the project, but never before the deadline of the call. Also, I want to remind that costs related to the purchase of translation and publication rights are not eligible. Or also, for example, if uh, an airline company uh, offers some uh, plane tickets for free or volunteer work, that cannot be included to, to increase the budget. Also, here in the section for uh, transport and uh, allowances, uh, daily allowances, to calculate uh, the cost of different uh, travels or housing, depending on the transportation method or the distance, we will have a specific quantity. That's the one we can uh, include. It refers to round trip tickets always, and also about the housing, depending on the destination country. We will um, get an amount that we can spend. And as I was saying, it's very important if there is any change in the content, you need to tell the project officer. But the most important is to um, respect the deliverables. They, uh, you will not have to justify in a specific cost. I'll stop sharing my screen because I'm going to show you very fast. I'm going to um, share the budget so you have an idea. Can you see that? No, we can see your presentation. You don't see the budget? No, we're seeing the presentation. It's the same image. Uh, okay, yes. Very quick. This is the budget. This is the template that you're going to see. First, you need to see the instructions. Uh, they told you before that we need to uh, you need to fill in the maximum amount. Okay, see, here I specified 60%. You need to specify the maximum, not what you are going to apply for in the end. Here, for example, if I... For example, here, the contribution. So it wouldn't let me, for example, here you specify 100,000, uh, the maximum amount, if it's the uh, small projects. And here you have 60%, which is uh, the uh, maximum co-funding amount. Then you have the list of beneficiaries. I included two here, for example, a publishing house and a distributor that you choose as a partner because they are going to be relevant for the strategy. If you want to add any others here, you click add a beneficiary, double click, and then you apply the changes. Then here you have the list of work packages. 
I'll explain it a little before here. See, here I already added some more packages. I included a few, for example, project management, the first one. Then if you continue translation, I also added that. And then I go back to the list. I don't know why it doesn't let me see all of them. Well, you add each of them. See here, you click on add a work package, double click, you apply changes and you would get the next work package. I added the translation one and also, well, I, I added these two and also the publication and distribution. Well, I would need to add the other uh, minimum work package uh, for uh, dissemination. We have two different tabs here because we included two different partners. You, they have the same the same structure, but you don't need to fill in each uh, section for all of them. For example, if you want to see, for example, staff costs, direct personal costs, you have first uh, employees, uh, uh, those who are part of the staff, right? We have employees. Uh, type one and you are the monthly cost for example if the work coordinator well you need to calculate the months but if the project is going to be for example i don't know imagine 24 months you need to have an estimation of uh, the real time that that person is going to dedicate maybe it's not going to be full-time contribution so we calculate the, the that time in months then you can add another type uh, of uh, personnel. Then we would have, a, in other, we could inclu include freelancers, which is usually the case for translators. They are uh, freelancers. Then we have uh, seconded persons or other people outside the partnership. For example, one person for a specific, very specific task. Then in section four, we could add uh, partners of a publishing house, for example, who don't have a monthly salary because it's uh, just a small entity. For example, we could indicate this uh, here. And as I was saying, volunteers here, the, the cost would be zero, but you, you need to bear in mind that this uh, form, this template is used for other calls where the requirements are different. Then subcontracting costs. You need to group it all together because you only have one line. Essential tasks like translation, publication, uh, communication, all these activities that are essential or distribution, they uh, are not considered outsourced uh, resources. And since the main activity, they they cannot be they should not be outsourced for example translators so that's why uh, translators would be included in a2 they are freelancers or other costs uh, or their distribution costs uh, in uh, c for other services for example what about travels uh, you need to group everything together uh, here in, uh, we need to choose the, the, the unit, right? For example, if it's five books that I'm going to have in the project, uh, I need to explain. Well, the, the units can be whatever whatever you want, whatever the participant wants. Uh, it can be per day or per number of books. or uh, You just need to group it all together and specify the unit. For example, uh, if I'm going to have five travels, because I have uh, uh, five people, each of them uh, with uh, specific travel, well, I, I specify all that. And then I explain in the comments, I explain that the, well, it's, uh, the travels are for the five authors or the, or the five translators who are going to have uh, uh, some travel for, for promotion actions. 
Carolina, we need to, we need to, uh, we're really far behind. Yes, and the same for the rest of the tabs. Uh, we don't need to fill in all the all the tabs. The consolidated one is automatic, for example, and this one as well. I would only need to fill in well the costs, uh, the depreciation costs, as I was said, or here in any comments you can explain how you grouped all those costs together. Well, explain different uh, aspects uh, that in uh, some grouped uh, data. Uh, you need to specify here the explanation of how you grouped all those information, all that information together. And I just want to provide some. Uh, links that might be useful uh, they are in the presentation sorry just one second we will upload these uh, however on our website so you can access all this information we've had many other uh, sessions training sections and you can check all these and for any specific questions you can call us or uh, send us an email and uh, we will answer all their questions at the end thank you isabel and carolina we have limited time for the webinars and we are exceeded also thanks to Nacho, the technician, and Maria, who is translating. We're going to give the floor to the case study. Uh, Susana, we always like to illustrate uh, successful case studies. Uh, this is uh, the, the case. Thank you. Good morning to you all. I'll try to be uh, fast. Uh, and I hope that my uh, presentation encourages uh, many of you here to apply for these uh, grants. Can you see the presentation all right? Yes. Well, very briefly about our publishing house. Calimatazo is an independent publishing house. Uh, I'm in a business. I funded it with my partner. I'm the one who I have a full time dedication. We are very young, four years actually, and we are um, specialized in uh, literature for children. Uh, we focus on uh, illustrated albums. Uh, for us, the literature proposal is uh, very important, but the quality needs to be also is very important for the aesthetic and the, and the illustration part of the projects. Um, our idea was publicating relevant works uh, and, uh, of outstanding authors uh, around the world. So to bring all those works to the uh, Spanish market, although we also have our own uh, books, but the, the, the seed, the origin of this project is the, of this project is, is this line, which is actually very closely linked to the to the goal of this uh, call. We have been beneficiaries in two occasions. In 2020, that was the first time that I applied for the grant uh, with a project that you see here, Nature and Wilderness in Northern Europe, Literature for Children. The main topic here was the importance of nature in Northern uh, countries and its relationship with children. And we wanted to show this with different uh, works from these countries. This year, we've also been beneficiaries of this uh, grant with another project, project Resilience and bond, Bonding in European Literature for Children and Youth. In this case, uh, we were dealing with the importance of, uh, the, of emotional uh, bonds in children and the youth for them to be resilient when facing different conflicts. Um, we decided on this topic uh, uh, after the pandemic and also war, about the war in Ukraine. I'm going to focus in the project that we had two years ago. I'll talk a little bit about it. So you have an idea. This is the project, the project that we just finished. Um, as I said, the main topic was nature in northern countries and its relationship with uh, children. I identify and selected four different works, in this case with lesser spoken languages. Uh, this year, for example, in the package we've included in the project we're working with now, we have one one of the works is in German, so it's not mandatory, it's not compulsory that all the works are in lesser spoken uh, languages. So we have one in 
uh, Finnish uh, with the translation of Luisa Gutierrez. Then we have two works in uh, Swedish, uh, El pájaro que lleva dentro, vuela donde quiere, with different translators. And then we have a book from Norwegian, from Norway. Uh, as you can see, the minimum was three books uh, two years ago. I selected one more. And this year, the same. If the minimum is five, I selected six books with the idea to have, well, some uh, margin. Because sometimes the negotiation of the rights is difficult. So I always uh, selected one more book so I could have that in case one of the books uh, didn't come across or I couldn't finally manage the, the rights. It was very important uh, in a project like this uh, that they are very high quality works. They were works that had received awards and also the authors and the translators uh, recognized the representatives in the sector. And this has been said before, but it's, it's very important. We had a distribution strategy plan for each of the works. In our case, we work with children and uh, youth literature, so we can have, well, a book for three to five uh, year old readers. And it may be very different to, well, El Pajaro Que Ivandro, for example, is for 10 year old uh, or older readers or even adult readers. So we have to bear this in mind and we need to have some balance um, with the quality of the works, the quality of the authors, and also the promotion plan. It needs to be balanced because the idea is to reach the maximum possible audience, right? But, uh, we already said that. So this is the case of this project. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I prepared the proposal. Of course, each of you may have your different methodologies, but I'm going to tell you how I did it in case it's useful for any of you. First of all, the documentation, as uh, they've told us, it's very important to read the, the call document, the, to, to, to know what they are asking for, because that is going to be our uh, theoretical framework, our uh, the, our project is going to turn around all the things that are requesting from us in the in the call document. As Isabel said, I always had the call document with me when I was uh, writing my proposal because that's what go, that's going to tell me what's important. We'll see how we need to justify the project. Uh, all, all our argument needs to be based on that. So it's very important. Then, of course, to be familiar with the templates, with the forms that we're going to use and the interesting documents. I think this is very important as well. Anything related to the translators, the uh, translators on the cover report, the good practices uh, report. We are going to apply all that. For example, in our case, we've applied all that to the agreements that we signed with the translators. We always uh, included the translators' names on the cover, everything. So it, it's very important to have all that information so we can apply that to our project. In this case, uh, for these grants, uh, translators are, are, well, they play the main role <laughs> in the project. Um, so once you have everything, you're clear about all this, then I selected, identified the, the topic, what I wanted to focus on with my projects. Uh, the selection of the titles of the works needed to be consistent with all these. But I think that's the easiest part for, for a publisher, right? For anyone who wants to, to apply for these grants. So once all this was clear, I, I started writing my proposal. And as you were said, each uh, section has its objectives, with how we need to explain all that. But we always have doubts. And whenever you have a doubt, don't hesitate to, to ask uh, uh, people in the offices. They are going to answer and to clarify anything you need. Then the resources in the Creative Europe uh, office, uh, I, I, I contacted them twice. When I was writing the proposal, I 
sometimes uh, lack experience, for example, in the area of uh, promotion or communication, the evaluation indicators that they told you about. Um, don't worry about that because there are many resources on the website, uh, on the Creative Europe website. As I told you, there are webinars, different training sessions, and you can use all that. It's going to be very useful. I, I, it was very useful for me two years ago uh, for the promotion or this year also for the uh, evaluation uh, indicators. Also, estimated uh, uh, deadline. Uh, uh, Two years ago, I was the one who prepared the proposal. I did it all on my own. So the first time, obviously, well, it takes longer, right? Uh, because you need to uh, understand all the theory, all the documents, the terminology, the interested documents. You need to, to, to understand all that context. So it takes time. It takes time. It's long. But once you've done that, uh, for example, this year, for me, it, it was uh, shorter. For me, it took me a month this time uh, to prepare everything. Uh, some of the things, uh, this sounds really evident, but it's very important when you, you need to, to, to really provide all the information. You don't need to understand that that the information information is obvious. Well, you need to include the names of the translators, to include their biographies. We need to include the logo because we need to understand that, well, the proposal, uh, we, we know everything, but the expert evaluating the proposal doesn't know anything about us. So sometimes we think it's obvious information, but we need to provide all the information for the expert to 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 get the information we, we want them to, to know. The translators, uh, we need to, to really give them all the importance that they have, they need to have good remuneration conditions. Their remuneration needs to be fair. Uh, in our case, for example, uh, usually the translators were working with fees per word. Uh, another translate, translator preferred a slum sum. Uh, but we need to, to, to have a balanced retribution for all the translators participating in the project. And then also, of course, we need two uh, translators are are not only the the, the the protagonists here. We we need to 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 also count on them for the promotion and distribution of the works. And also about the application, the budget, anything that we include, any tasks, any actions that we include, that we say that we are going to have it needs to be reflected in the budget. So uh, if we say we're going to have to, to create promotional uh, documents, uh, a brochure, bookmarks, I don't know, whatever we can think of, obviously we need to include that in the budget as well. Uh, or uh, the, the, public, the design and publication and the printing of the, of the bookmark, for example, we, we need to include all that in the budget. It needs to be consistent. All the different sections need to be consistent. Another piece of advice, the deliverables. We, it's better if we don't include only the compulsory deliverables, but um, try not to have too many additional deliverables because, well, it's more work for us and also more work for the, for the evaluators of the projects and for our team, okay? So, so let's try not to have too many additional deliverables and then uh, justify all the data and uh, any time that we have uh, I don't know anything specific that we had for the project always justify it with some statistics or because it's going to be a more solid proposal so uh, always if you can try to find a survey a research that can uh, back up what you are proposing, okay? That way the, the project is going to be more solid. And then finally, always ask uh, uh, the Creative Europe office for about any doubts that you have. And well, here I, I, I wrote F4 last time equals uh, results. It's true that preparing these proposals, this application takes time, but you, you need to see it as an investment because you're really going to, to obtain a huge benefit from it. So uh, it's not wasted time at all. 
even if you are not in the end beneficiaries of a grant uh, it's something that you've prepared uh, for future calls for example sometimes uh, uh, your project is not selected but that's uh, work that you already have prepared for other future calls where you can be selected and well just to to close i wanted to show you some examples for example the promotion uh, some action promotion actions uh, we have here in the cover of the book we have the name of the translator uh, in the events also uh, have the translators are as participants in the events for example we have the present we had the presentation for the book and we had the translator we cooperated with uh, other institutions we can see also the creative europe logo the biographies of uh, translators of course include them in your website on the books or on the also in the uh, promotion materials so we can give visibility to translators also the the, lo the creative europe uh, hashtag or the creative europe logo mm, always try to give visibility to, to the program and to the to the translators and that will be all on my side thank you very much thank you for for your invitation thank you very much susana uh, now very fast we move to the questions isa if you're going to ask uh, to read the questions please and we are going to ask ricardo if you don't mind asking your question out loud, uh, the question you posted about the distribution costs, Ricardo, would you mind? That way you can explain it better. And since we have uh, Maria with us, uh, she can uh, translate so Corinne and Laura answer the question. Ricardo, are you there? Yes, hello. Yes, hello, Isabel, how are you? My question uh, is about the distribution costs, how you include them in the budget, because, well, the Spanish uh, system, as you know, it's a little particular about, about this. We cannot... Um, estimate a, a specific cost for distribution it's like a percentage of the of the sales so how would we reflect this in the budget i don't know whether it's easy to explain or can you hear me all right yes yes i i understand that maria is translating Yes, um, I can take the question. Um, it's always an estimation in any way, in any way. So um, you put the estimation cost for the distribution uh, or in other costs or in purchase costs. This is what we uh, suggest uh, to do uh, to, the, uh, to the applicants. But maybe we can ask uh, Susanna where uh, she puts the distribution costs in her project, in her application. Well, it's true that it's quite complex. Uh, in both occasions, what I did, I, I included uh, the, all the distribution costs well uh, all the metadata and uh, for the distribution it, it was kind of a lump sum because it's very complex yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, depending on how the different distributors uh, work uh, so that that part of the budget specifications it is, it is quite complex it's, it's an estimation an estimation you can yes for example if I estimate that the first edition is going to be sold, fully sold, uh, so I estimate uh, the distribution cost for that uh, first edition. Yes, yes, and obviously 
also the associated costs you may have, like or, or the shipping costs as a publishing house, all that, right? Uh, yeah, but for yes, the... Yes. Sorry. Yes, all the uh, post uh, costs, all the shipping costs, uh, shipping of online orders. Yes, yes, all that. It's no, it's it's more. I was referring really to the to the total amount of the distribution costs, like the total. I didn't know exactly where I could specify that. Well distribution uh, but the, the problem is how you, you can calculate how you can estimate uh, the amount but obviously it's uh, the, the estimation that you can actually try to, to calculate and as Corinne was saying uh, it, it's not in outsourcing right in subcontracting it's no, in the no, purchase no. of uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes yeah yes yes, yes. yes exactly yeah, okay. thank you very much as a general rule, um, there is um, no or very few subcontracting costs for the uh, this uh, peculiar uh, project for literary translation project because we consider this all the distribution cost, uh, promotion, translation, etc., publication as purchase cost or other cost and not subcontracting because uh, it's really related to the core activities of the of the project of course so uh and in principle subcontracting costs uh should not be um uh, linked to core activities so this is why we suggest to put the distribution cost uh, promotion uh, etc in purchase cost or other costs and we um just to add something on on this um, important point uh, we don't uh, ask you to uh, reinvent uh, the wheel or something uh, or to create something from scratch. So we just um, ask you to um, uh, to put uh, your estimations and according to your usual um, uh, practices, you know. So, um, and if, there are some doubts uh, we can uh, discuss about it uh, when preparing the grant agreement if you are uh, selected. So uh, no worries. Uh, if you put some lump sums or some uh, <clears throat> estimation, rough estimations, it's absolutely fine. Okay, thank you very much. And you, you will see in the budget table, you have also the possibility, and we, we recommend you to use this possibility to add some comments, to, uh, to justify or to explain what you put this cost and um, according to, um, yes, according to um, which rule, etc. Okay, great, thank you very much. We don't have any other questions in the Q&A section. So we can, uh, if there is any other question, we will take one last question and we close the session because we are uh, a lot over the time. Yes, one hour. Uh, any other questions? Um, also for Brussels time, I'm sure they are uh, starving already because it's the last time there already. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the attendees, of course. Uh, we hope this has been useful for you. As Susana told you, uh, our obligation as an office is to give you all the support, all the technical support you need and accompany you uh, uh, throughout the whole process uh, of these proposals. So I insist, we all insist uh, from the office here in Madrid uh, we want to thank again uh, Corinne and Laura and uh, thank you for accepting the invitation because well we are aware even if we even if this is online and uh, but it's always good to, to have a face there behind the screen it, it always uh, helps the participants of course thank you um, to Maria because uh, I uh, used her services for one hour more uh, than we were expecting and also Nacho to our technician 
now after the little brief video that we're going to show uh, please i remind you if you can please uh, uh, fill in the survey and thank you <laughs> 